Okay. All right. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, uh, I would like to start by giving my most special thanks to Artemis Georgia and Yenir Milanevsky for their kind invitation to be part of the Arva Levant lecture series. It is a pleasure and honor. Very recently, I gave a lecture at Arva Anatolia regarding the in-depth understanding of the second millennium BC of the Amuk Valley of Hatay by particularly concentrating on the results of the multi-proxy archeological research program conducted around the capital city of the kingdom of Mukish, Telachana, and Toprakisaru within the larger frame of the Amuk Valley Regional Project. Today, we will concentrate on the preliminary results of the large scale and multi-proxy sediment coring program in the Amuk Valley. Thus, in the first part of this lecture, I will only provide a summary of the results of the ongoing archeological missions where major episodes of cultural, political, and economic processes are defined. The environmental data, which is the main focus of this lecture, will be presented by my colleague Ula Shaushar, the director of the Geoarchaeological Research Program in the Amuk. In the last section of this presentation, I will present our interpretative understanding of the relationship between geological and archaeological data. And afterwards, uh, we will be delighted to hear your opinions in the discussion. The Amuk Valley of Hatay, located in the southernmost fringes of Turkey, has a crucial value in understanding particular periods of transformations. As we state, it has not only been a region of rich agricultural potential through time, but also a buffer and an impact zone where traces of cultural, economic, and political interactions between Anatolian, Near Eastern, as well as Levantine, Egyptian, and Aegean counterparts can be traced from stages of chiefdoms to city-states and then to kingdoms and empires. Presenting at Arva Anatolia and now at Arva Levant marked the significance of the Amuk Valley to its connected and neighboring regions. This certainly owes to Braidwood's pioneering survey and excavation program in 1930s. The established regional chronology still stands as an anchorage point for researchers interested in the larger understanding and synchronization of cultures over longer durations. Thus, the region has the potential to provide answers to a long list of research questions that dominate the literature from modes of cultural interaction to state formation, collapse, reurbanization, imperialism, or long distance mobility patterns. In addition to the presence of a rich archeological data set, Amuk Valley offers the possibility to test the relationship between climate change and societal reactions through time. This is due one of the most remarkable aspects of the valley that defines the methodological starting point of this research, the presence of the now drained Amuk Lake. In theory and in practice, the presence of a lake allows us to reconstruct the micro environmental history of a region and, and to correlate it with archeological data obtained from high resolution stratigraphical excavations conducted in the region. In other, in an other words, for an archeological understanding of the impact of global climatic events, such as 8.2, 4.2, 3.2 BP, or for micro-regional less discussed events, such as 5.2 K, or impacts of catastrophes, such as the Santorini eruption, we don't need to go far away to seek for polyenvironmental data. This theoretical and methodological approach to Amuk Valley is not new and was first implemented during the second round of archaeological surveys conducted by Kutlu Aslan Yener. By then, the main goal of the survey was to understand the shifting settlement patterns in relation to the turmoil political history of the Near East and Anatolia via interconnected research strategies targeting the exploration of environmental 
and anthropogenic factors over the changing landscape. Tony Wilkinson's geoarchaeological research program set the foundations of the sediment pouring strategies developed especially in and in around the Amuk Lake and in the vicinities of Telachana and Taltainat. The first round of geoarchaeological research program resulted with the understanding of the gradual expansion of the Amuk Lake from Chalcolithic to Iron Age, providing the first data set to define the relationship between changing landscape and the responses given by the inhabitants of Amuk Valley under diverse political and cultural entities. The results brought up the potential of geoarchaeological research in an alluvial floodplain and took the landscape further beyond being treated as a passive background. Then it became a primary interest for teams of Tel Achana and Tel Taina. The efforts and motivations of both teams relied on the fact that a settlement shift occurred between these two tells corresponding to time periods of 4.2K and 3.2K BP events, thus making it necessary to cross-correlate alluvial sedimentation with archaeological sequences. As part of the new round of Amuk Valley Regional Project, we expanded this approach by first designing new mechanical systems to acquire truly undisturbed sediments to collect environmental data. Sample variation is increased by selecting different pouring locations that included both the lake and the nearby stratigraphically excavated archaeological sites. The correlation strategies included absolute and relative dating methods, as well as the relationship between environment and plant consumption patterns. The sites include the uh, late 7th to 5th millennia BC settlement of Tel Kurdu, 3rd to 1st millennium BC capitals of Tel Tainat and Tel Echana, and the relatively new excavation project of Toprak Serhuk on the southwestern outskirts of the Amuk Valley. Although the Amuk Valley has a long historical uh, research, unfortunately, there are still some of the major periods that are not properly understood uh, in the valley. The renewed excavations directed by Rana Özbal from Koch University will now provide the possibility to understand the early uh, phases, especially the early Neolithic phases in the region and the establishment of the site following the 8.2K BP event. And uh, hopefully with uh, Rana Özbal's new renewed excavations, uh, we will get more information about the prehistoric sequence of the Amuk Valley, especially on the Northern part. And when we go to the uh, actually Southern side of the valley, here comes the relationship between Tel Tainat and Tel Achana. We know that uh, both of these sites occupied uh, in a time period stretching from third millennium to uh, end of second millennium BC and then to first millennium BC, but their relationship was always uh, entangled. So we know that there is the early Bronze Age uh, occupation at Tel Tainat. Then we have the second millennium BC occupation at Achana, and then there is a shift back to Tel Tainat. But the recent excavations shows that this scenario is a little bit more complicated than expected, since Achana is also now producing uh, Iron Age uh, material. But of course, uh, the beginning uh, of this story is more interesting because we learn about the name of the city, Alalah, Alalahum, uh, from Ebla archives from third millennium BC. But when we come to the Amuk, the textual evidence is actually coming from the level seven Middle Bronze Age, uh, level seven palace complex. So this means that at least the name in the early Bronze Age was very much likely related with uh, Tel Tainat. Of course, this is followed by an uninterrupted second millennium BC sequence uh, at Tel Achana, where we have the evidence for both the Amorite kingdom of Yamhat with the Yarimlim dynasty, followed by the Mitannian hegemony in the region. And this is represented by Idrimi's dynasty. And this was successfully replaced by Hittite administration. 
But uh, because of the, the problem in terms of our data gaps, we really don't know what's going on in the beginning of the second millennium BC, especially at uh, Telechana. But there is also a second cycle of shift and at the uh, uh, Iron Age, the occupation, as I said, continued at Teltainat, but Iron Age remains were also encountered at Telechana, especially around the temple area. So recent discoveries now further adds to the fragmented nature of the evidence regarding the end of late Bronze Age, when the site witnessed to a dramatic period of collapse beginning at, the, let's say, early 13th century BC. So this relationship between these two sites has been framed by Aslahan Yenel under the larger concept of a mega city, expanding into two tales where its different sectors were settled in different times, being dependent on the shifting riverbeds of the Orontes River. So the extensive boring operations uh, conducted at Taina, but then also at Tel Achana, showed that likely in the second millennium BC, Telachana was surrounded uh, by the Orontes River this, throughout the whole second millennium BC. But the relationship between the Orontes River and the city kingdom of Alala in the Middle Bronze Age was so far was more presented in a two-dimensional form from uh, publication plans as there was not really much visuals left from this time period. Now, following a century-long process of decay, the gate system was physically inaccessible and lost. So our understanding of the relationship between monuments and their surrounding landscape was also less, it was also lost. As we recently accomplished the preservation project of the Middle Bronze Age city gate, our perception is now also altered. So, I mean, this is not really a fantastic artistic work, but here we can see that the, the massive Middle Bronze Age uh, gate complex seen in this slide was also likely accessed by boats and perhaps be regarded as a water gate, providing not only protection, but at the same time, riverine transportation, especially, which is important when we look at uh, to Middle Bronze Age too, when public monuments required heavy uh, raw supplies. So I believe river and uh, transportation was necessary in this time period. And of course, this is a tradition that's still alive and still something that you can see in the Amuk Valley when you go specifically to Northern part, to Kirkan region, where there's still marshes and where there are people using boats to navigate and to do uh, fishing activities. But when we look at the beginnings of the second millennium BC, unfortunately, we don't really get much information about this from the standpoint of uh, Telachana as the Middle Bronze Age soundings for the earlier part of the second millennium BC, uh, they are very limited in terms of the data that they present. And today, the archeological research so far conducted at Achana provides the earlier Middle Bronze Age sequence but unfortunately, this is still not enough to understand the third to second millennium BC transition. And same thing may also count for Teltainat because we have the end of third millennium BC at Teltainat uh, with their EB4B exposures, but uh, the gap between Tainat and Achana from an archeological standpoint of view is still there because we don't have that data from both of this site. So, but when we look at on this recent project that was uh, concentrated on the human remains from Achana, what we see, which is a very interesting point, is that the Middle Bronze Age human remains uh, from Alala, from Telachana, shows a significant change uh, in their genetic makeup when you compare with the Ebla Early Bronze Age examples. So it seems like at the end of third and the beginning of the second millennium BC, there seems to be political and a cultural change that we may trace also through the DNA as well. So where we get this transitional time period the, from third to second millennium BC, this is actually where we would, I would like to take you to the site of Toprakisar, which is located 
rather in a highland area in the Altınözü region of Hatay. So this is a relatively very small scale site. And by uh, because the, there was a dam constructed in 1980s, this was a necessity to run a research rescue excavation in the region because most of the site was already damaged by the dam itself. And we were quite lucky because from the very first day of excavations, it was uh, maybe let me say it's our luck because uh, we hit into a middle bronze one administrative building complex. And this was exactly the time period that we were missing from, uh, from in our sequence from the Amuk Valley. And uh, the almost seven years of excavations now allowed us to understand uh, what's going on from EB4B to MB1, and both from an architectural perspective and material culture perspective, we do see a significant uh, change in a peripheral site located in the fringes of the Amuk Valley. So this allowed us to create a, a, a continuous sequence from the same site and also to define the changing uh, patterns in the material culture. And thanks to uh, high resolution C14 dates acquired from Teltainat, now uh, we have the possibility to create a tentative chronology that connects these two sites and also puts Achana all the way to the end. So from basically end of third millennium BC to the entire second millennium BC and then to first millennium BC, we have a chronological sequence uh, established through this material, through this data set. So uh, in this part of this uh, presentation, I wanted to present you what we have in our hands in terms of the archeological material and this critical time points that are important in terms of understanding uh, these major climatic events. And now with this archeological data in hand, uh, Ulash will talk about uh, the sediment data and let's see how we can correlate this. So I'm now uh, letting Ulaş talk uh, from this moment onwards. Okay, hello everyone. I guess you can see my screen to confirm. Yes, all good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Murat. Uh, thanks a lot. You gave lots of uh, valuable archaeological information, and uh, I think it's time to talk about a little bit uh, geology, what we did, what ha uh, have we been doing uh, in Amik Valley. Uh, so, in fact, we started uh, a project in Amik Valley, already mentioned. Uh, it's titled Geological and Archaeological Traces of Climatic Change in Amik Valley during the Holocene. So within the scope of this project, we collected many uh, core samples uh, from Amik Valley. We also uh, study on archaeobotany, paleobotany, palynological studies, and we have lots of multi-proxy analysis going on. It started in March 2020, and it is going to end in uh, approximately uh, three months. So throughout my talk, I will first talk about the motivation, motivation why we're doing this uh, investigation, this study. And then I will talk a little bit uh, on previous works, what kind of paleoclimatic records uh, that have been obtained from the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, there are some problematic points about these records. I will uh, discuss a little bit about them. And uh, then I'm going to talk about the sampling and coring methods we applied because these methods are quite different uh, than the methods applied previously in the uh, in the previous studies. And then finally, I will talk about the current progress of the project and what kind of preliminary results we obtained in terms of uh, we obtained from sediments, basically. So the main research question of our project is uh, on did climatic chains obtained from geological archives really affected or affect human life and activities? This is the main question. And uh, we try to find if we can find the traces of human activities in the sedimentary sequences around the mounds in Amit Valley. 
Amik Valley is a specific or special uh, place in terms of uh, geology because uh, it is just uh, in the floodplain of a meandering river. First of all, I need to briefly explain what floodplain is, and uh, I need to briefly explain how the sedimentation takes place in this kind of geological settings. So here you can see we have a meandering river, which is Orontes in our case. And in normal times, the water flows in the channel, but during the flooding times, you have lots of water and you can break, you can bring lots of sediments in the floodplain. And when the flood is gone, everything becomes normal, but you put a little bit sediments in the floodplain. During each flood, during each flooding period, we have a little bit of sediments in the floodplain. And in this way, we have conti almost continuous sedimentation in the floodplain. So if we have sediments, it means that there's something recording environmental chains, environmental properties. So that is why Amic Valley is quite important. As you see here, here we have Achana, and here we have Taina. This is our Orontes channel, which is a very beautiful, well-developed meandering river. And all of the region as all of the sediments around the, these mounds are floodplain deposits of Orontes River, in fact. So as time passes, we have almost continuous deposition of sediments. In addition to floodplain deposits, we are lucky that we have a lake as well in Amic Valley. That is, this is Amic Lake. So lakes are much better sedimentary or depositional environments than floodplains because they mostly are covered by water and they're protected. The sediments or sedimentary record is protected uh, by that water. So we can have much better and well-preserved sedimentary sequences in lakes. So what we are doing, here we have an hypothetical drawing of the region. Here we have mounds, here we have Orontes River and floodplain deposits, and we have lake. So we are collecting, we collected cores from the lakes and we collected cores from around the mounds, around Kurdu, around Achana and around Tainat. And also we collected cores from Toprakisar. So in these cores, in these sedimentary cores, we are investigating the paleoclimatic chains uh, in terms of proxy reports. Now let's check what happened, what kind of information we have in the Eastern Mediterranean roughly in terms of proxy reports of paleoclimate. These dots are studied sites in the Eastern Mediterranean and all of these sites, the results of them are plotted in this figure. So the left-hand side, the anomalies towards left, tells you dry periods from these records. As you may recognize, for example, here we have anomalies showing dry periods, but if you put it 3.2 TA, some of the records are successful, but some of the records, they have shifts from the chronological shifts from the, uh, from the known dry periods. On the other hand, you can also recognize at the first glance that these records are not correlating well. So uh, in a regional scale, let's say having a diameter of 200 kilometers, uh, the common sense tells us that the climatic change should be recorded and climatic records, climatic records should correlate each other because the climate is changing in the same way. If you have dry period, uh, the proxy report taken from a lake should correlate with the proxy report from another lake approximately 10, 100 kilometers away. The problem in the region is the records are not correlating well. So there are some reasons of this. First of all, proxy methods are already have complex, they already have complexities in them. So they do not, they are not the direct measurements or direct estimations of temperature or uh, precipitation values. Another problem, 
most of the studies uses few radiocarbon dates. So we have chronological problems in the records. And the other one that we basically try to eliminate in this project, the core quality. So in most of the study, there is no mention about the core quality. During pouring, we need to be careful because we need to take the first step properly in order to achieve correct conclusions. If we cannot, if we cannot take the core properly, we may lose sediments in the sequence. So we may misinterpret some anomalies in the, in the sedimentary records. So what we do before I met uh, Murat, I was uh, working on lakes and uh, in marine environments with my coring platform like this. And we were collecting cores from the bottom of the sea or lake. We were stabilizing our platform like this with anchoring and we lower the system to the bottom and by hammering, we can easily obtain undisturbed sedimentary cores. If you look at closely here, as you hammer it, we have PVC pipe penetrating through the sediments, into the sediments, but we have piston here, which creates equalized balanced vacuum during each hammering so that you can eliminate the internal friction created by penetration. If you do not use coring, if you do not use piston during each hammering, because of the internal friction in the pipe, you're going to push your sediments down and down, and you're going to sequeeze them. On the other hand, the, at the tip of your corer, you may lose some sediments. So in the end, you're going to have much shorter sequence in your core, and you're going to lose sediments. And you will never know from which depths you're, you lost your sediments. Mostly in coring applications in geoarchaeological studies in the world, people use rotary double tube coring. So this is also another problem about coring in this kind of environments, because during drilling, you have rotation, plus you have circulation of water from this tube inside, and then it moves upwards in the well. During this water circulation, you can dissolve salt clays and sands easily. So in fact, you're losing material, you're losing sediments. So during each 1.5 meters drive, you're going to add them on top of each other. And in between them, you're going to have lost uh, information. So it may easily lead you misinterpreting the paleo environmental changes. What we did basically after meeting Murat and uh, in order to collect cores from Amit Wali, First of all, we increased the weight, hammering weight. We were using around 10 to 12 uh, kilograms. We started to use 65 kilograms of hammering weight. We started to use aluminum pipes too, in order to have a stronger system. We used the piston, of course. And at the bottom, we have a core catcher. We started to use a chrome catcher at the bottom of our system. In this way, we were able to collect cores, which are uh, collect cores from flat plain deposits, which are much, much stronger and stiffer than marine or lacustrine uh, lake sediments. Around Toprakisar, we used our platform because we already had a dam. We have water, so we directly use our system like this. But in the Amit Valley, we use a drilling rig and we attached our system to the drilling rig. And sometimes even the power of the drilling rig was not enough to penetrate our pipes into the sediments. So we were helping it uh, with this kind of efforts. Around, let me show you some examples from the cores uh, from Toprakisar. We collected this many. Here we have the Toprakisar mound. And here we collected the cores all around the mount. These are the optical images of the cores. Now I will show you how undisturbed our cores are. If you look at, if you have a closer look at this level, for example, you can clearly see the sediments, the layers are almost horizontal and they are flat. So normally the sediments are deposited horizontally. 
you do not you should not see any deformation in them in order to claim that your core is undisturbed so you can see here this is almost a undisturbed perfectly undisturbed core you can even see very tiny layers lamina that are probably related to floods in the region a little bit above to this region as you see here almost undisturbed layer and above it you have a chaotic sediments this is another story about the earthquakes of that sea fault in fact during the shaking of the lake or sediments you can easily create this kind of deformations and this deformation is most probably related to uh, the earthquakes of the Dead Sea fault. It is not because of coring. This layer here and this layer here confirms the success of undisturbed coring. Close to the bottom of your core, this is really important. Here we have fine grain sediments, clay and silt, and fine cell, sand. But at the bottom, we have gravels. Okay, We have even pebbles in the core, in the same core. We did not change the method. So with this method, we were able to collect continuous cores from finest grain sediments to very uh, coarse grain pebbles. So it was quite successful. So in the end, we can say we can collect, we could collect many cores from uh, around Toprakisar. So as you see here in the same core, fine grain sediments, and very coarse grain sediments at the same time without changing any methods. Anyway, so now we can talk about what else we did in Amit Valley. We collected 20 cores. You can see the locations here, for example, around Achana and Payinat. Here you can see a closer view. Around Achana, we collected five cores like this at these locations. And around Tainat, we collected two cores. Just next to Kurdu, we collected two cores, as you see here. And in the Amit Valley, we collected many, many cores, 11 cores, I guess, we collected along a profile. This is quite important. We did not prefer to collect only one core. If it was so, we would, uh, we would have to totally rely on proxy reports. But here we are trying, in addition to proxy reports, we want to see the size of the lake. We want to correlate these cores and we want to reconstruct the size and shoreline of the lake, how it changed, so that we can give much better information about dry periods or wetter periods. So in the end, we collected undisturbed 206 meters cores at 20 locations. And in addition to proxy recourse, as I already told you, we're going to check the real geometry, geometrical change of the lake. So we're going to have lots of radiocarbon dates as well. So if you check, for example, Amit Valley, uh, Amit Lake course, the images are extremely small. So here, let me switch to real pictures in real image in Photoshop, we need to check. We can zoom in here, for example, to the bottom of the longest core. It is about 21 meters long. And here, for example, you have a flood event here. And if you look at very closely, so even at around 19 meters deep, we have almost undisturbed uh, undisturbed sediments. They're almost flat and horizontal. So this made us very happy that we could collect undisturbed and complete records, sedimentary records from Amic Valley. So what we're doing in this project, basically, let me tell you a little bit about the uh, methods analysis we are using. First of all, of course, we are doing radiocarbon dating, but until now we are having some difficulties to find datable material, organic material in the cores, and we're extracting microcharcoals, and it takes really long time. Uh, so currently, we do not have any radiocarbon results, but we have collected lots of data on the cores, such as magnetic susceptibility measurements were completed, geochemical measurements, both 
XRF and ICPMS and OES measurements have been completed all in the course. And also we do ICPMS measurements on the mud bricks as well. And what else we have mineralogical measurements. We always try to confirm our uh, results, geochemical or mineralogical results with different methods in order to be sure if we see any anomaly in the records. In addition, we are also working on palynological records in these cores, pollens are extracted. And we also use paleobotany uh, methods and uh, paleobotanical contents of the course have been investigated. And we also have archaeobotanical studies from the mounds. Of course, we have, we produce lots of data. We produce incredible amounts of data. And we have a quite uh, a little bit crowded team. Uh, but here, I'm not going to talk about the things other than my expertise. So I will explain here uh, about the sedimentary geochemical recourse we obtained uh, from the course. So let's, let me show you some examples from magnetic susceptibility measurements, for example. From the, this is from the cores around Achana, five cores we collected from Achana. And these are the magnetic susceptibility measurements all along them. And we can see, we can easily correlate them. Okay, We can almost peak by peak correlate all of these cores. So this also confirms the success of undisturbed and complete coring uh, sediment cores. These were from Achana and these are from the course around Kurdo, KR1 and KR2. We can easily correlate between magnetic susceptibility curves. And also we have two cores from Tainat Mount. They also can be easily correlated by magnetic susceptibility measurements. And this figure illustrates the magnetic susceptibility measurements of the cores or along the profile, all along the line passing through the Amic Lake. So AL5 is the longest core. It is almost 19 meters long. And again, we can easily follow the correlation among the cores. So this is important. So in this case, we can reconstruct the geometrical change, uh, the size. We, we can reconstruct the size of the lake in the end. So these are all just a very small proportion of the data. It is just magnetic susceptibility. And uh, I guess we do not have that much time to present all of the data. But let me give you more examples from XRF measurements. Okay. So this is the Amic Lake core, which is located here. It is the deepest, longest core at the deepest part of the lake. And it is 19 meters long. And you can see the measurements of ITRAX micro XRF. And you see some elements, aluminum, silicium, potassium, titanium, iron, manganese, calcium, and strontium here. These are the main elements, but we have 10 more elements measured by ITRAX XRF as well. So these measurements are at every two millimeters. So we have really high resolution uh, XRF measurements along the course. So this is from Amic Lake. And here, we have the core, ITRAX micro XRF results of Purdu core. And again, you see lots of elements. Most of them correlates well with each other based on some geological principles. And what else here we have the cores, 81, 80, 81, 82, and 83 from Achana Mount, just next to Achana. And again, we also have lots of high resolution micro XRF results. And this is finally from Tainat. This is Tainat core. So uh, currently, this information, this data may seem meaningless to you because I do not want to create a mess in your minds because we have lots of data. But I will try to summarize what we are seeing in the course currently. So what we expect, what is the ge geochemical uh, significance or geochemical indicators of, for example, dry periods? So as I already mentioned, we are in a floodplain. 
Okay. So during a flood, what happens? Imagine we are collecting a core from here. What happens during a flood? During a flood, we have sediments arriving to our quarry location. So titanium, for example, represents the aluminum silicate minerals, okay? During this flood, we may have lots of aluminum silicate minerals coming to our pouring location. After the flood is gone, what happens? The, the water slowly infiltrates into the ground and also it evaporates. And during this mechanism, we also deposit lots of carbonates. And, and carbonates can be represented by calcium as well. So during the next flood, again, we are going to have titanium. And during the, after the flood, we are going to have evaporation and deposition of carbonates, which is uh, represented by calcium. So if we divide them to each other, calcium or titanium, and if we plot them, so any anomalies in this kind of curve will tell us that these are dry period because we have less during dry periods, we have less flood, so we have less titanium content. Less titanium content means higher values in this ratio. So any kind of anomalies like this can be interpreted as dry periods in this, uh, in this region. So let's see what kind of data we have, results we have. Here, AL5 is the amiplane core that is located here. And this is its plot, calcium or titanium plot, all along 19 meters long core. And as you see, as you can easily recognize, we have some anomalies along this core, anomalies in calcium or titanium ratio, which means these are dry periods. These are most probably dry periods. On the other hand, what we have here in reddish colors, we have KR1 core, which is from Kurdu. Mount, and you can easily correlate, stratigraphically correlate their calcium or titanium report. As you see, not as prominent as in the lake, we also have anomalies in Kurdu report as well. Okay. It is expected because lacustrine reports are much better, much more protected compared to floodplain deposits. So the anomalies are much well preserved in the lake report. So let's check another correlation in the type calcium or titanium ratio. This is AT1 core here, Achana core, correlation of it with the Amiplake core. Again, we see very similar anomalies and the general trends of the cores, calcium or titanium measurements fit quite well. So regionally in this Valley in Amit Valley, regionally we can easily correlate, geochemically correlate these cores quite well. So this is a very good news for us. So let's look at more in detail in terms of chronology, what we can do without radiocarbon dating. So this is the results of Amit Lake report, Amit Lake core, and this is calcium or titanium report from ITREX scanner, two millimeters resolution. And this is also calcium or titanium report from ICPMS, ICP OES measurements. And its resolution is every 12 centimeters. So they almost perfectly match. What we recognize here, again, we have anomalies showing dry periods. So let's try, let's make a try to construct an HDEP model for this report. First of all, you can see a general trend fluctuation, sinusoidal fluctuation in these reports, as I show here with blue regions, blue lines. And just after, just out of these lines, you can easily, much easier recognize the anomalies. So what we can say, close to the bottom of the core, as you see, we have a shift, almost a shift towards drier conditions. And if we put, if we, a sign that this is Holocene Pleistocene transition at this depth. And if you put our dot in the H depth model, so you can roughly try to estimate the age of the events. So here, for example, this anomaly, this very, let's say, tiny 
or non-distinct anomaly, maybe 8.2 Ka, it really fits well with the HZEP model. And here we have 5.2 Ka, this dry period. And here we have 4.2 Ka, perfectly matched with our tentative HZEP model. And also we have 3.2 perfectly matching to our tentative HZEP model. So in the end, along this amic valley core, which is most well-preserved sedimentary sequence in the, uh, in the project, we can calculate the sedimentation rate of 0.19 centimeter per year, which is highly consistent with the previous data, radiocarbon data records in amic valley, in amic lake. So in the end, what we can say, for example, 3.2, dry period, dry event, 3.2 Ka, it is 30 centimeters thick in this core, and it corresponds, it yields 160 years long period. On the other hand, 4.2 must be approximately around 290 years long, based on its thickness. And 5.2 seems to be around 130 years long. And finally, the 8.2 event, looks like it was 240 years long in this valley. So this is quite tentative HZEP model. We are extracting mi micro charcoals from these uh, cores and we are going to obtain radiocarbon dates in a few months. But tentatively, it looks like we have a very good chronological model here. So in the end, in addition to dry periods, 3.2, 4.2, 5.2, 8.2. We also have some wet periods in the record. Just before 5.2 event, for example, we have a significant implication of a better period. Just before 3.2, we have two quite significant wetter periods. We have this kind of implications. But we're going to make more detailed measurements, especially in terms of ICP measurements, ICP OES measurements, we are going to make these anomalies much more in detail. So at this stage, I put everything that I can say, but I'm sure I left some parts out. If you have questions, uh, I can easily, uh, I would be happy to answer them. But just before I'm leaving the stage, I need to leave the stage to Murat uh, with this figure so that he can give you a little bit more uh, information about the archeological meaning of this environmental record. Thank you. Okay, uh, hello again. Uh, I just want to give a quick summary of what we are thinking right now. Of course, we don't want to correlate every archeological event with environmental change. Maybe this may not be the right approach, but interestingly, as uh, Ulash uh, repetitively mentioned, this uh, chronological framework and the visible data that we have on the screen is, going, is not going to change. So that means at least uh, starting from uh, end of fourth millennium BC onwards, we seem to have uh, dry periods that are correlating very well with uh, what we conventionally uh, define in, an, in our archeological understanding as change. And also interestingly, uh, I prefer not to talk in detail about the prehistoric sequence because as, we, as I stated uh, in the Amok, there is a big gap for understanding the earlier time periods. But when we go specifically uh, to the end from end of fourth millennium BC all the way to first millennium BC. What is interesting also to note that all these wet episodes uh, that uh, Ulash marks are also uh, in our archeological understanding. They represent significant time periods, such as when we look at 3.5 and 3.8, uh, these are the time periods when we see the beginning of Middle Bronze II, so the reurbanization event or uh, the time period, especially when we look at from a Telachala perspective, the construction of uh, the level four palace and the 
let's say the secondary urbanization phase in late bronze one so in every 1000 year also there seems to be an anomaly going on in the amuk and this in our archaeological understanding correlates well so uh, at this stage uh, i think it would be best to answer now your questions because this is uh, our preliminary understanding of what's going on in the Amuk Valley from both archaeological and geological perspectives. Thank you. Öncelikle bizi Arva Levant online oturumuna davet ettiğinizi teşekkür ediyoruz. Biz bu proje kapsamında bugün özellikle Amikovası özelinde yürüttüğümüz arkeoloji ve iklim arasındaki ilişkiyi araştıran projenin e, ön sonuçlarını sunmaya çalıştık. Bu çalışma kapsamında ve bu sunumun akışında ağırlıklı olarak arkeolojik veriden ziyade e, çevresel veriyi ve yani burada e, yürüttüğümüz e, karot çalışmaları kapsamında elde ettiğimiz veriyi sunmaya önem gösterdik. E, bölgede yürüttüğümüz ve arkeolojik verileri elde ettiğimiz sunumlar e, birçok farklı online oturumda verildiği için biz böyle bir e, akışı tercih ettik. Ama özetlemek gerekirse e, Amikovası özellikle hem e, 1930'lardan günümüze kadar devam eden e, zengin bir e, arkeolojik araştırma geçmişine ve bu arkeolojik ar araştırmalardan elde edilen yüksek çözünürlüklü veri setlerine sahip olduğu için ve bunun yanı sıra aynı zamanda günümüzde kurutulmuş olmasına rağmen geçmişte var olduğunu bildiğimiz Amik Gölü'nün varlığı nedeniyle arkeolojik ve jeolojik verinin bir arada eşleştirilebileceği önemli bir coğrafya haline geldiği kurgusu üzerinden bu projeyi gerçekleştirdik. Ve bu bağlamda özellikle Amikovası'nda e, stratigrafik ve yüksek çözünürlüklü arkeolojik sonuçların elde edildiği Tel Kurdu, Tel Tainat, Tel Açana, Toprak Hisar gibi e, uzun soluklu arkeolojik kazıların e, yürütüldüğü noktaların civarından elde edilen sediman karotlarıyla Amik Gölü üzerinden aldığımız sediman karotlarını eşleştirerek arkeoloji ve e, jeolojik literatürde e, 4-2, 3-2 gibi önemli iklim anomalilerinin arkeolojiyle ya da arkeolojik veriyle olan ilişkisini anlamaya çalıştık. Ve bu bağlamda bizim özellikle e, 4-2 ve 3-2 olarak tanımladığımız erken tun çağın sonu, geç tun çağın sonu gibi dönemlerde gördüğümüz önemli e, arkeolojik literatürde yer alan sistem çöküşleri ya da kırılma noktalarının izlerini jeolojik olarak da takip edebileceğimizi gördüğümüz sonuçlar elde ettik. Ama tabii ki bu çalışmanın e, tek çıktısı ya da temel nihai amacı e, ar iklimsel değişikliklerle bütün e, arkeolojide gördüğümüz değişimleri eşleştirmek değil ama özellikle iklimin de önemli bir e, etkileyici faktör olduğunu söyleyebiliriz. E, bu konuşmanın Türkçe kayıtları, benzer Türkçe kayıtları farklı e, online oturumlarda verildiği için ilgilenenler birazcık YouTube plan araştırdığında bu karşımıza çıkabiliyor diyorum ve hızlıca e, Ulaş'a devrediyorum. Ulaş da özellikle bu projenin metodolojisini özetlediği zaman sanıyorum ki Türkçe özetimizi de vermiş oluyoruz. Teşekkür ederim. Um, Olash, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, Murat Hoca'nın verdiği bu değerli bilgilerin ardından uh, ben de projeyle ilgili daha detaylı uh, sedimenter kayıtlarda, sedimenter istiflerde, amik, uh, amik uh, ovasındaki sedimenter istiflerde Holosan boyunca yaşanmış olan iklimsel değişikliklerin sedimanlarda nasıl kaydedilmiş olabileceğine yönelik olan projemizle ilgili hızlıca e, bilgi verebilirim. Öncelikle Amik Ovası bir e, baskın ovası, e, su baskın ovası ve su baskın ovalarında da zaman geçtikçe e, görece düzenli sedimentasyon 
e, olabiliyor. Şu bölgeden karot aldığımızı düşündüğümüzde e, her sel su baskını sırasında bir miktar sediman geliyor ve şey gittikten sonra su baskını gittikten sonra biz karbonat çökelimlerinde de eşlik ede, ede, edecek şekilde görebiliyoruz bu su baskın alanlarında. E, Tayinat ve Açana e, höyükleri ve Kurdu höyü etrafında e, ki e, sedimanlardan örselenmemiş karotlar aldık e, ve diğer taraftan da eski Amit Gölü şu anda kuru olmasına rağmen eski Amit Gölü içerisinde de bir hat boyunca e, birçok örselenmemiş e, sediman karot örneği aldık e, ve paleoitimsel kayıtlar elde etmeye çalıştık. E, bunlar bölgedeki diğer elde edilmiş, Doğu Akdeniz'de elde edilmiş diğer paleoitimsel kayıtlar. Buralarda bazı tutarsızlıklar olduğunu biz fark ettik. Özellikle kronolojiyle ilgili. Kronolojiyle ilgili olan bu tutarsızlıkların da bir miktar önüne geçmek için bol miktarda karot alıp bol miktarda da radyokarbon tarihlendirmesi yapmaya çalışacağız. Kullandığımız sistem denizlerde ve göllerde piston karot sistemi olarak bilinen bir e, sistem. Denizin gölün tabanına karot yer bu şekilde aşağıya indiriliyor ve çakma işlemi ile PVC boru sedimanının içerisine e, penetre edilmiş oluyor ve böylelikle sedimanı e, örselenmemiş bir şekilde alabiliyoruz. Bunlar metodolojik bazı detaylar. Bunları biraz hızlıca geçmek istiyorum. Temelde aldığımız karotların ne kadar örselenmemiş olduğunu göstermek için bazı karot fotoğraflarını burada gösterebilirim. Oldukça yatay ve düz bir şekilde laminasyonlar görüyorum karotlarda. Bunlar karotların sediman karot alma operasyonunun oldukça başarılı geçtiğini bize gösteriyor. Aynı karotun içerisinde hem silt Kil malzemesinden karot alabiliyoruz. Hem aynı zamanda da e, çakıllı malzemeden, oldukça iri çakıllı malzemeden de karot alabildiğimizi gördük. E, biraz daha ilerlersek, Amit Gölü'nden bir sürü karot aldığımızdan bahsettim. Birçok e, yüksek çözünürlüklü ölçüm yapıldı bu e, karotlar boyunca. En önemli ölçümlerden biri, 2 milimetrede bir yapılan ölçümler itrax e, mikro XRF tarayıcısı dediğimiz meta deniz araştırmaları dairesinde bulunan e, bir cihaz bu. E, bu cihazla yaptığımız ölçümlerle 2 milimetrede bir birçok elementin dağılımlarını bu şekilde karotlar boyunca elde edebildik. Birçok karotta bunları yaptık tabii ki ama ilerleyecek olursak bir miktarda amik gölü karotunda ne tip data elde ettiğimizi hızlıca göstermek istiyorum. Dediğim gibi de şeyler sırasında, su baskınları sırasında aluminosilikate minerallerinin baskın olduğu birçok sediman karot lokasyonumuza gelebilir. Titanyum genellikle aluminosilikat minerallerini temsil eden bir element olarak kabul edilir. E, su baskını gittikten sonra, sel gittikten sonra da yavaşça karbonat çökelimleri olabiliyor bu tip bölgelerde. Karbonatlar da çok basit olarak kalsiyum ile tespit edilebilir, temsil edilebilir. Kalsiyumu titanyuma böldüğümüzde öyle bir orana karot boyunca baktığımızda doğal olarak kalsiyum bölü titanyum grafiklerinde anomali veren, yüksek değerler veren yerlerde daha az sel olmuş, daha fazla karbona çökelimi olmuş. Yani bunlar kurak dönemler anlamı çıkarılabiliyor. Oldukça basit bir e, yaklaşımla. E, şimdi Amit Gölü Karotundan ne tip bilgiler elde ettiğimizi hızlıca göstereyim. Ee, burada kalsiyum bölü titanyum grafiğini görüyorsunuz. İtraks mikro XRF'den 2 mm çözünürlükle elde edilmiş grafik bu. Bu da ICPMS OES'lerden 12 cm'de bir elde edilmiş. Yine jeokimyasal datanın kalsiyum bölü titanyum oranları. Birbirlerini tamamen neredeyse tutuyorlar. Sadece çözünürlükleri farklı. İlk bakışta ana trendi görüyorsunuz. Burada mavi e, renkle gösterilen yerlerde. Ve anomoller görüyoruz. Kalsiyum bölü titanyum oranlarında. Ciddi anomoller bunlar. Biraz karotu tarihlendirmeye çalıştığımızda elimizde şu anda radyokarbon yok ama şuranın holosen pleistosen geçişi olduğunu kabul edebiliriz. Tabana bunu koyduğumuzda ve düz bir çizgi çizdiğimizde 2020 yılına doğru 19 0.19 santimetre bölü yıl sedimentasyon oranı elde ediyoruz ki bu daha önce burada 
çalışılmış olan şu lokasyonda, şu lokasyonda ve şu lokasyonda çalışılmış olan tarotlarda radyokarbonlar sonucunda elde edilmiş sedimentasyon oranıyla tamamen tutarlı bir sedimentasyon oranı. Ve gördüğümüz kuraklıkları da literatürde biraz iyi bilinen 8.2K, 5.2K, 4.2K ve 3.2K olarak buraya plot ettiğimizde bunların hepsinin tutarlı bir şekilde derinliklerinin bu olaylara kurak döneminde denk geldiğini net bir şekilde görmüş oluyoruz. Ve bu şekilde e, yaptığımız çalışmanın ana temel e, sonucu şu anda bu e, şekilde e, aslında tamamen gösteriliyor. Ama ilerleyen dönemlerde bunu daha detaylı e, bir hale getirmeyi planlıyoruz. E, teşekkür ederim ilginiz ve sabrınız için. Thank you. Thank you. Teşekkür ederim, both of you. And uh, have a lovely continuation of the project. And we look forward to the results. Thank you again for agreeing to this and all the best to you and your research. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Good night.